What? Was that an amen? Put her on the couch. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't even have to bribe her with like lollipops or nothing. That was awesome. Okay, so uh, we're, we're in the book of Romans, so let's just open up our Bibles, just get our Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's Bibles all over the place. Don't shortchange yourself. Look at God's Word. I might be fibbing. I might be fibbing. You wouldn't know it, right? You wouldn't know it unless you had your, your eyes on God's Word. There's a lot of people that get up with a fancy suit and a lot of and nice ties, and they don't know. They, you don't know. Just because they said it doesn't mean it's the truth, right? So you've got to grab a Bible, even if you don't have one. You can use one of ours, and you can take it with you if you want. Orange and yellow, the, the Bible verses that some of them, we're going to be all over the place tonight, but some of them are going to be up on the screen, the, the page number and everything. You can follow there. If you have an iPad or an iPhone or whatever, you're more than welcome to jump on one of those things. All right, so we've been studying through the, through the Scriptures. We've been studying Romans because we want to understand what the Gospel is. It's the core of everything that we do, right? The church is centered on the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I want to start here. Let's start here. Romans chapter 1. Let's go back a little bit. Um, Paul said something in Romans chapter 1. And he says this. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. Side note, I really like the fact that it's written in the present. You know, I don't think that's by mistake. Do you? Anything in the Bible, the mistake? It's written in the present because he's at work right now. Do you know that God's at work right now working on you right now? Right now he's at work saving you. Right now. It wasn't something you did back then. It was that he's doing it right now. It's in the present tense. It's not by mistake. Okay, so here's the thing. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So he's like, I'm not ashamed, although some people uh, are not like me. He's like, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Like, I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm spiritually bankrupt and I cannot get better. Like everyone on earth has this thing. They want some transcendence. They want something bigger. They know that there's an afterlife. They're trying to get there, right? And everyone has all these different ways they try to get there. This is, this is angst inside of all of us to try to, to get better, to have a relationship with this God, whatever God they're looking at, whatever God they think they see. But all of us have this desire for something more. And Paul's like, you know what? I'm not ashamed to tell you that there's no amount of religion, no rules, no amount of church, no giving, no charity, no nothing that's going to get me right. I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you that, that, that I really can't fix this eternity that's in my heart that's causing me to want something. I can't get there. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm also not ashamed to admit that God notices this. I'm not ashamed to admit that God saw our brokenness and sends his son to fix it. I'm not ashamed to say that I am not a subscriber to any set religion. I'm just not ashamed to say that it's me incapable, God very capable, very observant of what his creation, knows exactly what's going on, and willing to come and fix it. I'm not ashamed of that. That's what Paul says. And so I'm not ashamed, he says, of the good news. The good news that I can't do nothing. I can't get better. I'm not ashamed of the good news that says Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God who didn't need to come down here. He was already God no matter what. But he comes down and he pays the price, the one and only price, the one penalty that needs to be paid for. And he does it. And Paul's like, yeah, I'm not ashamed of that. I know that that's the only thing that's going to help me. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I can't help myself. I'm not ashamed of it. I hope you feel the same way. But here's the thing. So there's the gospel, right? There's the gospel. I'm, I am incapable. God is willing and capable to help me and save me, right? To fill that, that angst inside of me, that, that, that the thing for eternal life that I want, this afterlife, this the future, something bigger than my job and my house payment, like bigger, I want that. And so we got that gospel of Jesus coming to save sinful man, but here's the thing, that's God's part, right? That's what God did. So the question is for us as a group is how do I handle that? What do I do? with this truth. And so, so tonight I just want to kind of, I don't want to shift our focus onto ourselves because it's still on God. We're going to search his word to give us some answers. But the question is here is, well, how, how do I handle this thing? How do I handle this truth that, 
that I just shared with you. I don't normally name my message. Where's my water? I'm dying over here. Where is it? So thirsty. Can someone chuck that up? I'll get it. <laughs> Who cares? So I don't normally name my message, but tonight I want to name it. I'm going to name it because it, it's there's some questions I think a lot of us have, and I think that God will answer your questions tonight in what we share. And we're going to be all over the scriptures. But I'm going, to, I'm going to name it Responding, Remaining, and Returning. Responding, Remaining, and Returning. And so when we talk about what, can we do, what, do we have to, what do we do with this gospel that God's done? What do we do with it? The first thing is we have to respond. Um, the creation's obligation, that's a rhyme, creation obligation, is that we must give in and accept what the creator has done. You see, we can't make up our own stuff. Would you all agree? Like you weren't there when you were conceived. Like you had nothing to do with that. You didn't create the air you're breathing. You can't make your heart beat. Okay, you can't do this. So it's our obligation as creation to, to I hate to use this word, but cower, if you will, give in to and accept and respond that which the creator reveals to us. Do, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? We can't make stuff up, okay? So the first thing we have to do is we have to respond to revelation. Now, revelation, when I use that word, many of you, when I say that word, you'll think of that spooky book at the end of the Bible with end time war and Armageddon and, you know, Satan and devils and creatures with eyeballs all over them, and it's scary, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. When I say responding to revelation, I'm just going to give, tell you what I mean by this. It is the creation's obligation to respond well to that which God reveals of himself. I hate to use the word reveal in revelation, but I'm sure you all can understand what revealing is. Disclosing something of himself and who he is and what he's to do. Do you understand? So, so revelation is God re revealing to his creation who he is and how we are to respond, how things work, disclosing these things, okay? So the first thing that we have to do when it comes to the gospel is we have to respond well. Now, nothing has changed. He's been revealing himself since day one. We, when, when we read Revel, um, Romans chapter one a couple months ago, we saw that, that, that God has created everything. We can look and touch and smell and feel and hear all that he's made. And that's all he's asking from that is that you would acknowledge this God, that, that you would acknowledge that he's done all these things. And he says that you can look and feel and touch and smell and hear, and you can know of God's divine nature and his power. You know of his creativity. You know of his variety. You know about him. That's all you got to do is open your eyes and see. So that's what he's saying is, hey, we, listen, would you just acknowledge me as God? So the next step in his revelation is, he ad is, is adoption. So he adopts the Jewish people. We talked about that last week. We, he says, okay, this little nation over here, I'm going to adopt you as my children, and I'm going to show myself strong through you. I'm going to perform miracles uh, amongst you so you can see how powerful I am. I'm going to do miracles in front of your enemies so they can see how powerful I am, and I'm going to give you my rules and my laws so that you can live well together, and that the nations will be able to see a country that lives differently. So he was ultimately just revealing himself to the world through his law and adoption of the Jewish people. Now what he's done since that time is he speaks through us through prophets. Now if you do me a favor and look at Hebrews chapter 1. The page should be up on the screen, I hope. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at the first verse. He's disclosing things to his people. He's talking to his people he says here, the author says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. So you think of guys like Moses, and you think of guys like Jeremiah, and Elijah, and Isaiah, and Elisha, and Obadiah, and Micah, and Malachi, and all these guys among others. And he, what, this is what God does. He, he says, I got something to say to people. So he goes and he finds a guy, and he whispers in his ear, and he says, King fries are better than McDonald's. And then he says, now go tell people. You seriously, go tell people. 
You can yell it out loud if you want to. Thus saith the Lord. Burger King, yeah, he's got something to say. No, let, all kidding aside, so he's got something to say to people. And so what does he do, right? He goes and he finds a man and he, and he tells the man and then the man is to tell the people, correct? That's what he does. The whole Old Testament's filled with that. Now the greatest prophet of all is Jesus Christ. Now some might say, well, I don't understand that. I thought you said he was God. He's the son of God. He's deity. Yeah, he is. But he's also an amazing prophet. He's the greatest prophet of all. Why? Because a careful study of Scripture, Jesus tells you himself that I only do what, what I see my Father doing. I only say what my Father tells me to say. So really, what is it? The God-man hears from God, the Father, and does exactly what he's supposed to. He says exactly what the Father wants to say. So everything that the Son says to us is ultimately where did it come from? God the Father, the unseen one, the ancient of days. So nothing has changed. He always finds a man. He tells the man, and the man tells the people. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed for us today. The Great Commission's the same thing. God, Jesus, the God man, says, hey, Dad, what? Okay, teach them this? Yes, he teaches them. And then he tells us in the Great Commission, now go make disciples, right, of all the people, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've taught you. He didn't, by the way, just so you know, he never said, go teach them to memorize everything I taught you. Okay, and that's what happens. But he says, teach them to obey everything that I taught you. And so the same thing, nothing's changed. God tells the man, raise your hand if he told you this. Come on now. Did he tell you the great, are you part of the great commission? Right, you've been, you've been given a sacred trust. You know the gospel, right? And so he says, now listen, y'all, I told you, right? And now I want you to go tell everybody else. So he tells a man or a woman, and they are to go tell the nations, okay? God tells a man, and man tells the people. Listen, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing the word of God. There, listen, I, I'm gonna ruffle some feathers. There is no, there is nothing in Scripture that clearly tells us of lifestyle evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism is not a biblical form of evangelism. Lifestyle, if you're Christ-like, people will see it, and they will wonder. But you know, when you're really, really a good guy, you're really, really a nice gal, because Jesus loves you and you're responding to that, that's awesome. But if you don't tell them why, you know what happens? They idolize you. They go, oh, he's a good guy. She's a nice lady because you're kind. You, listen, at some point, you got to tell them about Jesus, right? you got to tell them about Jesus. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so pastors and teachers and preachers, and, and when they get up here and someone shares the word of the Lord with you, that's a gift from God because Romans 12 says that, that faith comes from God. Every amount of faith that you have, any ability to believe in him, trust him, love him, follow him, that is from God. He is gifting you with that. And it comes from hearing. So when you have the websites with, with all these people giving podcasts and YouTube videos, sharing the gospel, sharing God's word. That's a gift from God. We have to tell them about Jesus. Romans 10, 14, and 15, just before the verse I just shared, and you don't have to necessarily read it right now, but jot it down and look at it, but let me summarize it for you. Basically, it's this. How can anybody believe and accept God's gift of Jesus and his salvation unless they are told about him? So, listen, we have to tell people about our Jesus Christ. The only way they accept and follow is if they know. Otherwise, they give praise to the nice guy. The one who acts Christ-like will receive praise, and that will not be allowed in the kingdom of God. You understand me, right? So we have to tell people about Jesus. And let me tell you something. This system that you live in, this, this country, the system that runs it is hell-bent on destroying Christianity. Hell-bent, literally hell-bent, right, on destroying Christianity. Why? You don't talk about religion and politics. My sister wrote that on Facebook last week. I ripped her a new one. Can someone say amen? amen. Right? I love my sister, but Jesus said, what's going to happen? 
Boop, right? I ripped her a new one, right? I said, wait a minute, hold on a second now. I remember a while back, about 200 years or so ago, there was a couple of people that came over here and said, wait a minute now, we're going to have a country where we can do that. We're going to have a country where it's not only okay, but encouraged to share our beliefs and our views. And they even put it into the Constitution and everything so we could. Now, don't you dare speak of religion and politics. And she said, don't in bold. You know when someone's yelling at you at Facebook, it's bold, right? So she was yelling at everybody, don't talk about religion and politics. I'm like, why are you yelling at everybody? And by the way, you telling them that they can't, you're trying to steal from them the exact right you're exercising right now. Oh, she didn't like that. I didn't talk to her for days. Right? She's one of them. <laughs> now we're buddies again. <laughs> I don't know why you sit up here. <laughs> well, listen, seriously, the system is driving you. Listen, please, I beg you, revolution, right? Listen, don't buy into that. Don't buy into the you don't talk about religion and politics. Let me tell you why. There's a guy named Jesus. And he told you, Christian follower, to go and tell the world about him. You have to tell people about him. Don't you give in to a system that will tell you otherwise. Jesus like Christianity, Christ, you, you tracking, right? That's the name. He said, go do it. And what did he say at the beginning of the Great Commission? I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So if the king of kings says to go tell people, you don't listen to nobody else. He said, go tell people about me. You go tell people about him. Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Don't fall for that scam. He says all through the scripture, I, the Lord, have spoken. That's what he does. He speaks to his people. We're supposed to be Christ-like, I think. I read it in there somewhere. So we're supposed to do that, I think, okay? So let's get back to where we're going. I just got a little sidetracked. So over time, his, his, his disclosure, his revelation progresses. It progresses. He's not a changing God. He didn't go, man, the creation thing failed. <laughs> Dang it, Holy Spirit, what are we gonna do? Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Let's give them rules so they can't have any fun. Then they'll come after me, I know that, I know that, that'll work. How'd that work with your kids? Yeah, okay. So, so that didn't happen, but his disclosure progresses, it doesn't change, but it's for, it, over time it does, change. it does progress. But listen, it always commands a response. We always have to respond to it, right? We just have to respond to it, and let, let's go here. Acknowledge, obey, in love. What am I talking about? In creation, Romans 1, it says that creation screams divine creator, right? And so that's all he wants to do. If you're reading, he says they didn't even acknowledge. He just wanted us to acknowledge him, and nobody does. Nobody does. Nobody did. Nobody does. And so the next step was adoption of his people. He says, all right, here's my creation first, and then he says, here's my laws. Obey them. You can read that. You know, Genesis, Exodus, all there. And then the next step in his salvation, we're living, he says, here's my son. Love me. First it's, a, here's my creation, acknowledge me. Next one is, here's my laws, obey me. Now here's my son, love me. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know when Jesus was getting baptized? When he's coming up out of the water, there's this voice. The unseen one speaks audibly. And there's a voice, he says, there's my dearly beloved son whom I'm, I am well pleased. Beautiful, right? He's speaking and then Matthew 17, this thing called the transfiguration. Jesus is on the hill with his, uh, just a couple of his disciples. And Moses and Elijah, they've been long dead for hundreds of years. They show up on the mountain and Jesus turns bright white. Like his face has got lightning all over. Like, woo, crazy sci-fi stuff, right? And here comes the voice again. He says the same thing. He goes, there's my dearly beloved son who I'm well pleased. And he adds this little caveat at the end. He goes, listen to him. Listen to him. And so... If the father says, listen to him, and the father told him what to say, as creation, we're obligated. We're obligated to listen and obey. And what does he tell us? John 14, you trust in the father, trust also in me. I and the father are one. Nobody comes to the father except through me. John 1, 18. Can you look at that? 
No one has ever seen God. But his son, his son, who is himself God and near to the Father's heart, he has revealed God to us. Jesus Christ reveals the unseen God to us. He is the latest and greatest, most complete revelation of Almighty God, Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord. And now some people might just not like that. In this world, they'll tell you that there's just, just one God, but there's a, a thousand different ways to get to him. You hear that all the time, don't you? I hear it all the time. I don't even have TV. It finds its way. There's one God, but there's a thousand different ways to get there. And so when someone like me stands up and says, you know, Jesus is the only way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. I am God. You've got to come my way and do it my way or the highway. That's it. And people are like, well, that's not fair. That's not right. I don't like that. Well, you know, I'm not going to get spiritual on you here. Tough. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't like it that way. Well, you know what? I don't like that the earth is spinning because it gives me a headache. Can you stop the rotation of the earth? How about no? <laughs> How about I'd like to dunk? I'm only 5'11", but I'd really like to dunk. So could you stop that whole gravity thing for a little bit? How about no? How about that we aren't, so, well, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's unfair. Maybe we don't like the fact that it's Jesus and Jesus only. Maybe people don't like that. Tough. I, I, love, um, I love how God knows that that's going to be people's response. And he answers that with an attitude. <laughs> Romans 9.20 says, Who are you, a mere human, to argue with God? Can the creation argue with the creator? I don't like the rotation. 23 degrees is just off for me. Can we? No. That's the way I set it up. That's the way it's going to work. You're the creation. You're not the creator. You can't argue with the way I'm going to do it. You had nothing to do with it. You weren't here. You weren't here when this all happened. You weren't here when I laid it all down. Who are you to say? That's the way I'm doing it. You should be happy I even told you how. <laughs> right? John 21 this is another story. You can read it later. John 21, Jesus with a great attitude. He answers the same rotten attitude that we have of, that's not fair. You guys want to say that? It's fun. <laughs> it's not the same without a microphone, but that's not fair. <laughs> that's a, that was pretty good. Who was that, Ben? Nice. So Jesus, in, in John 21, Jesus is hanging out with his, his disciples, right? And he's hanging out and he says, Peter, apparently when you read the, John 21, he's now told Peter how he's going to die, like when it's going to all happen. You know, you're a Christian, okay? You're going to die and it's going to be in this fashion, right? And so Peter's like, oh, okay, okay, I got it. And he looks over and he sees the other disciple, John. He goes, well, okay, I'm going to die in this way at this time, but what about him? And Jesus is like, if I want to keep him around, alive, until, I, until the second coming, what's it to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not your business. I, I'm God. See, we all think we're God. So we try to impose our human thinking on this, this crazy and undescribable God. Like, we can't do that. And, and so he's like, what's it to you? Don't you love it when your parents say, because I said so? And that's what God's doing here. Jesus is like, because I said so. But he says it differently. And, he, and I, I referenced it a little while ago. I love it. I, I just love it. I love the, one of the reasons why I love the New Living Translation is because of the way it, what it says. I, the Lord, have spoken. Have that, buddy. What you gonna do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the way it's gonna be. And so here's what Jesus this, Jesus is like, okay, this is the way it's going to be. And you've got to give in, right? So here's, an, here's another command. And people don't like it. It ruffles their feathers. Responding, right? Responding. Acts 17.30. I command, say this again with me last week. I command everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sin and come to God. That's what he says. Let, how, let me ask you guys a question. How much wiggle room is in I command everyone everywhere? How many, yeah, I was going to ask you, right, zero. 
There's, there's no room for imagination or creativity on this one to make up your own religion. He said, I command everyone, everywhere to repent of sin and turn to God. And that doesn't mean the God that I like best. The one that I'll conjure up in my own mind. I'm going to worship this water bottle. Can't do that. See, if you read on in that section of Scripture in verse 31... He explains this. He says, listen, I want you to repent and I want you to turn to God. Who's this God? Who's this God? Who's this God? Can you make it up? Listen, right? Can you make it up? Can you make it up? No, no, no. He goes, no, no, no. I have appointed a day of judgment when everyone will stand trial and we're going to decide who's in and who's out. And I've appointed a man who will sit on that throne up there, the judge. And I've proven to you who he is by raising him from the dead. Who's a Bible scholar in here? Can tell me who that might be. Oh my goodness. So you can't make up your own thing? So there's a guy that's going to decide, hey, you're either in or you're not, and guess what? It's Jesus. You were with me? Good. You're not out, right? And so li listen, some of you will say, when we talk about the fear of the Lord around here, you go, oh, that's a reverent fear. No, it's not. It's fear. It's fear. You want to know why? Because some of us will come up and we'll say, I was a Christian. I believed in you. I had the bumper sticker. I had a cross. I cast out demons in your name. I healed people in your name. I prayed in your name. I did all this stuff. And Jesus is like, we had nothing, dude. That should fear. That should put some fear in you. You think, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. No problem. I mean, I don't like give him anything of value of my life, but I believe in him. The devils in hell believe in Jesus. They aren't going to be in heaven with y'all. News for you. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just believing. You can believe. You got you to you get into it, man. <laughs> you got to give your life to Jesus Christ, right? You got to. And that should put some fear in you. Not to question your salvation, but to pursue him greater. That's all. Just to pursue him greater. So we have to respond. Let's go to the second thing. Let's talk about remaining in him. Let's talk about remaining in him. See, the gospel isn't some one-time fix-all pill that you say at the altar to let Jesus into your heart. I don't even know where that comes from. It's cool for Sunday school. But that's not really what it is. It's not just that you believe in Jesus and you go, okay, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and so Jesus got this. This, this, this eternity thing, and I can just continue to do what I'm doing. I can still live the way I want, but Jesus got this thing called heaven, right? No. It's in the famous words of the, the theologian, his name was Roscoe P. Coltrane. He said, we're in hot pursuit. We're going to be in hot pursuit. Yeah. Hot pursuit of the Lord. Right? That's what remaining in him is. It's not just saying, yeah, Jesus got this. I believe that he's the guy who went to the cross and paid for it. Is it bad to say in church, please don't pee your pants? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that. Y'all are crazy. Can I read some, I just, I just want to read some scripture to you. This will calm you down because I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to read. Can you guys do me a favor and go to John chapter 15? Hmm. Seth, I love you. I don't know where you're at, but you're here. It's good times. Let's talk about remaining. John 15. I'm going to read one, two, three, four, five sections of scripture here. This is the reading part. You ready? I'm just going to read. Then we'll tear it apart a little bit. Jesus is talking. What does that mean? Listen. listen. Yeah, you were listening. The Father said, listen to him, right? Listen. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. In other words, you're saved. You believed it. You're started. Good. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. There's some stipulation there. 
For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Some branches are gathered into a pile. To, such branches, not some, such, all. Branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Can I read you another one? Um, go back to Romans chapter 11. I told you we'd get there eventually. You see, a very, it's, it's an agricultural display here. You know, not too many insurance agents back then. Not many stockbrokers. A lot of farmers. So we talk in farming terms so they can understand. 11.17. You can see it's very similar. It's talking about the children of Israel, his chosen people adopted. They're in, they're part of the family, right? But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, so it's explained, have been broken off. And you Gentiles who are branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, so he acknowledges that's the truth. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe, so don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen, for if God did not spare the original branches, he won't, or perhaps won't, spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. The word fear is in there because you should fear. Now, there's, a, there's something in here I'm going to read on because this stuff is, these, these verses are pregnant with truth. But the one thing I want to point out to you, remember I said as his revelation progresses, we as the creation are under obligation to accept that, Right? So they accepted the fact that they were adopted in, but when his next step of revelation came in the person, the perfect person, the perfect prophet of Jesus Christ, what'd they do? No. He told them that he was coming. He, he warned them he's coming. And when he came, what'd they say? No. Heisman. And so because... They didn't give in to the next pro the progression of revelation. What happens? You're out. It says it. Did I make it up? It says it. Okay, let's read on. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Remaining in him. Remaining in him. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Now let me ask you a question. When he says brothers, who's he talking to? Brothers and sisters. What is it? All the believers. Christians, right? Would you, would you agree, Christians? So when the Bible refers to brothers and sisters, they're Christians. Okay. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving. Turning, away, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Fear. Fear. You know, that's what I'm doing right now. And some of you have already heard this stuff out of my mouth, maybe a couple times. You've been here, we've been together, what, four years now? You may have heard me talk about this. My, it's highlighted. That means I preached out of it before. I don't remember, but I probably did. But what does it say in here? 
That we're to warn each other while it's still today. Is today today? Yes. What about tomorrow? Is tomorrow today? Yeah, it will be. Gotcha. There's a Spaceballs line in there somewhere. You just missed it. Right? Yeah. Right? We're supposed to warn each other every day. Encourage each other to remain and press in and get to know the Lord. Read more, study more, pray more, serve more. Get to know the Lord. Listen, it's not just me. What does this say? Is this written to pastors? Who is it written to? Brothers and sisters. That's why we gather here. And when you come here on Saturday night or Sunday, whenever you get here, it's to encourage each other and to warn each other. Hey, listen, I see you slipping. I see you slipping. I need to get you back on track. You've fallen into sin a little bit. Get off your phones. Pay attention to the Lord. Don't be texting while the word of the Lord's being spoken to you because you're drifting. If you want greater faith, you want to obey him more, and you want to love him more, and you want to trust him more, faith comes from hearing the word of God. So when someone is preaching the word of God to you, stay off your phone. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you encourage one another. You warn each other. Listen, when, 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 the, when your faith isn't growing... It's not that God turned off the faucet. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. He sends guys, gals, guys, people, online, books. The Christian bookstores are full. All these magazines come. The word of the Lord is being proclaimed. And we're not paying attention. And we wonder why our faith isn't growing. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so we're to get together and warn each other not to fade away, but to get back on track. And that's what I'm trying to do here for you tonight. I hope you appreciate it. First John chapter 2. <clears throat> First John chapter 2. We're remaining in him, right? First John chapter 2, verse 24. I'll give you a second to get there so I can grab a drink. First John chapter 2, verse 24 says this. So you must remain, that's where I got that, plagiarism. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. So there's some stipulation there if I'm reading right. And in that fellowship, like not in another fellowship with someone else, not joining the union, but in fellowship, joining arms, common goal, you and Jesus, you and the Father, in that fellowship we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. Mm. Here's the last one. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to call this the Austin verse. Right, Austin? It's my favorite section of Scripture, man. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Two, I'm sorry, 21, 22, and 23. You ready? Y'all there? So he's talking about Jesus as the image of God, the eternal creator, the eternal sustainer. He says, but he made peace with everybody by sending his son. And it says this, this includes you. Who would that be? Anybody here? This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result of this death of Christ in his physical body on the cross, he has brought you into his own presence. God has brought you into the throne room of Almighty and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. You belong on the couch. <laughs> now, hold on a second. You got to read on. That's the reality. Jesus went to the cross. He paid for your sin. The Father sees you as holy, blameless, and without fault. But... But, 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 what does it say? But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Not bits and pieces of it. 
All of that. All of what he thinks of you, what he sees, what he's done. You've got to believe all that, it was, that precedes what this says. You believe all that. It says, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. You have to hold on to it. And that's why when you jump down to the bottom of the page in chapter 2, it says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him and let your roots grow down deep. And so that's that encouragement, that warning. You're drifting, you're drifting, you're drifting. Get back on track. You're not really letting the Lord follow. You're not following the Lord. You, you, you say you believe in him, but you're really not on track with him. Let's get back on track, brother. Let's get back on track, sister. I notice you're not attending as much. I notice you're not serving as much. I notice you're not singing as much. Your hands used to be up, but now they're kind of crossed. What's going on, brother? Let's talk. Encouraging, warning one another to get back on track. See, I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong. You guys, let me ask you this. How often do you run into a Christian who will just openly come to you and say, you know what, I just don't believe in Jesus anymore. I don't believe that he's the son of God. I don't believe that he's divine. I don't believe that he's a creator. I don't believe that he fed all those thousands of people on the hill. I don't believe he went to the cross for me. I just don't believe that. See, you don't hear people generally say that. You might hear a stone-cold atheist from the giddy-up say it, but most of the time you're not going to run into Christians who just verbalize those things. You don't hear that too often. So when I talk about remaining and getting back on track, I'm not saying that someone's going to go from on fire to saying no, verbally denying Christ. You don't hear that too often. But lordship, the lordship of Jesus Christ is what's at stake here. That's what we're talking about. Who's the lord of your life? And so, so listen, the lordship of Jesus means I trust you, Jesus. The lordship of Jesus means I love you, Jesus. I obey you, Jesus. I will follow you, Jesus. I believe not just in you, but I believe you, Jesus, that when you say this, it's the best and I'm going to do it. I want you, Jesus. I crave you, Jesus. You are the pearl of great treasure to me, the center of my affections, the core of my heart, the hot pursuit of my life. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's what it means to remain in him. Not just the one time I took the pill, I said the prayer, I asked Jesus into my heart. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going after him. The greatest treasure of your life. Is that the focus of your life? Are you going after Jesus with everything that you are? That's what I'm talking about. That's what it means to remain. Don't fade. Still trust. Still love. Go after him. Remaining in him. Now listen, don't start tweeting Oh, this guy, this Pastor Moses, he's, he's telling us that if we sin, we're out. That's not what I'm saying. Don't you dare tweet. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? Don't do it. Look, at the Bible talks about this too. Let's bring it back to the scriptures, right? Forget what I'm saying. Y'all know who King David is? Right? Right? A big player in the Bible, right? You know, in, Romans, uh, in Hebrews 11, there's this faith hall of fame, the guys and the gals that are in. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you know, right? Right? The ones that are in, he's listed on there. He's in, right? Adultery and accessory to murder. I think those are sin. In America, <laughs> who knows? Let's just call it politically correct. He wandered and he was naughty. No. He was a cheating, lying murderer. That's what he is, right? But he's in, right? The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. He sinned, right? Jesus, ever, anyone ever heard of Abraham? The guy who's the, the, the first Jew, right? The first guy. He's the, he is the example, the high watermark of faith. If you have faith like Abraham, like no rules, regular, no, forget that. I just absolutely 100% trust and believe and love you. Yes. No matter what I've done, I told that he's the faith standard, right? You have faith like him. You're a child of Abraham. You are in. He tried to pimp out his wife. You all know that? Read Exodus 20. He had a hot wife. I have a hot wife. I love my I would not try to pimp her out. <laughs> so he's got this hot wife. Apparently Sarah was like smoking hot, right? So he goes to this town, and he knows everyone's going to try to get her. 
So he's like, yeah, honey, I'm, don't tell them we're married. Just tell them you're my sister. You can sleep with them, but if they try to get you and you're my wife, they're going to try to kill me to get you. So just, here it is. Abraham. Want to talk about generational curse? Careful what you do in front of your kids. Guess what? His son did the same thing. Careful what you do in front of your kids. Read it. You got a book. Read it. Yeah, his son did the same thing. Careful what you do in front of your kids. How about Paul? Anyone ever heard of Paul? Guy wrote half the New Testament. Planted, I think, 14 churches. Appointing elders, preacher, greatest evangelist who ever lived. He's in. Who admits he's in? Totally in, right? Guy wrote half the New Testament. He in Romans 7, he said, I do everything wrong. Total, he said, I'm a slave to sin. Now, he, obviously, he's trying. He wants, he says, I love the law of God. Like, I want to do it. His heart was right. His actions were kind of naughty. So it's not a matter of if, if you sin, you're out. That's not what I'm trying to teach you. Remaining is lived out in desiring God, in seeking God, in wanting God. God. That's what I'm talking about. See, I really believe that the gospel frees us up. I think that the gospel offers us, that's not funny. The gospel offers us, offers us, it offers us freedom. But it's not freedom to just go ahead and sin and just feel like you got a pass. See, the apostle Paul addresses this in Romans 6. One, he says, should we sin more and more and more so that grace would abound? Like, the more I sin, the more God can show off how awesome he is by forgiving more. Like, if you do one thing wrong and you forgive that, that's a good God. But if you do a hundred things wrong and you forgive that, then you're an awesome God. That's the mentality of some crazy people. And Paul's like, no, of course not. That's not the way it is. No, I believe that the gospel frees us up to feel embraced and loved by God, and free to be able to worship him outside, but not excusing our sin. That our sin does not put us in bondage and unable, because these great men of faith, Paul, right? He worshiped God. He, he gave his life to God, right? He gave his, literally gave his life for the gospel, right? But he was a sinner. He sinned and sinned. So we have this, the gospel frees us up to, even though we sin, to still feel loved, to, to feel his loving arms around you and to love you. You should still feel that outside of our sin. And listen, I think the Revolution Church is that kind of place. I do. Someone's getting killed. It's no big deal. Attention. Just pay attention. Meredith's in there. It's, she'll take care of them somehow. Someone's probably getting whooped right now. Right? Edit that too. Okay, so totally the DCF's going to come knocking on the door. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. So listen, I think Revolution Church is that kind of place. I, because listen, I know most of you. Some of you all are here. I've never met you before, but I know most all of you. And I know that we sin. I sin. You sin. We all sin. Everyone sins. But, but for some reason, we can still come in here every single week, and we can just raise our hands, and we can sing to the Lord. So I'm seeing this truth lived out in our lives. I do believe that we're that kind of a church, family, that, that just knows that they can be loved by God and embraced by Him and worship Him freely, even though we fail in many ways. But I think we could do a lot better. And the reason I say that is because I know that even though we do that, I know that some of us, including myself in times past, have shunned those that sin. Now, we'll, we, we sin, all of us, anyone in here sin? I, I, I do, I do, I'm, I, I'm, I'm bad, I'm bad. But yet I know I can come in here, and if you all ever see, like, don't look at me, look at the cross, but if you ever just catch me out of the corner of my eye, I'm still, I'm still worshiping, I'm into it, right? I know God loves me, and I love him, and I'm letting it out, right? I love it, I'm pouring it all out to him. I, I, I get that. But yet I know that there's others that, that have sinned, and I'll just blast them on Facebook for it. And then I'll come in, praise you, Lord, I love you. That madness needs to stop. I challenge you. I challenged some this week. 
before you post anything, anything, whether it's on our church's page or your own about anything, just ask yourself this one question. Will what I'm about to post draw people to my church and to my Jesus or, sh or shove them away? Amen. Just think of that before you post. I'm not going to comment on who did this and who did that. Y'all can fight about that like a bunch of crazies. But I'm just telling you, ask that question. Let's get back on track here. Let me, let me give you this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Would you read that with me? We're remaining. We're remaining. Are you remaining? 517. Some segue, I'm, uh, there's a segue from, from what we do on Facebook and how we interact with people and how, uh, the way we look. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. And I love this word. This is the most important word. Behold, behold, the new has come. Now, you won't see that in the New Living Translation. Behold. What does that mean? It means you're going to be able to see something, isn't it? You're going to see it. You're going to see it, that it's not just the reality that it's a new person, but that you should be able to see that they're a new person, right? You should be able to see it, that there's a new person. See, we all fail, but, there's a big word, but what is seen? What is seen? Are you different? Is, is, is Jesus the focus of your thoughts more often today than he was before? Or, or how about this? Is the, the focus of your thoughts more today than he was yesterday? Don't let yourself off the hook so easy. Like I think if we set a higher bar, we'll, we'll get there, right? It's like the fish tank. You put a fish in a little tank, they only get so big. You put them in a bigger tank, what happens? They flourish, right? So set our bar. Don't just say, are we better today? Are we more Christ-like today than we were six years ago? Fiddlesticks. Who cares about that? What about today versus yesterday or last week? Let's keep progressing, right? Remain, keep going, keep going, keep pursuing. Is the word of God a treasure to you or is it a burden? When I say open up your Bibles, you go, ah. Are you a Psalm 119 guy who's just pouring out, I love the laws of God, I love the word of God. It's the treasure of my life. I can't wait to live by your word. Do you wake up in the morning and excited to mine through the scriptures and say, hey, God, what do you have for me today? I want to be more like you. Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you can't wait to come here on Saturday night? I hope that we're there for three hours reading the word of the Lord because I need it, I want it, I desire it. I want it more than dinner. I want it more than my family. I want it more than my car. I want it more than anything. I need this. I treasure it. Is that you? I don't know. Are the material things losing their tug on your wallet? Are material things losing their tug on your wallet as your generosity swells? Your generosity swelling as gathering for yourself begins to fade. Is obedience growing and rebellion dying? You gotta ask yourself these things. This is remaining in him. This is remaining in him. Can you see a different person in the spiritual mirror? I mean, honestly. Can you, can you see a different person in the spiritual mirror when you look at yourself? Here's another one. Can others see a different person when they see you? And listen, if you can answer that question of yourself, that you can see someone different in the mirror, I think that's good. But yet, do you have a, a crazy desire to say that's not good enough? And I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. That's the, that's the desire of your, is that the desire of your heart? And is it shown in the life that you live? Or is the word of God a burden to you? It's just another thing that takes up my already busy schedule. Or would you do this? And clear that schedule out. And the priority of my life before I do anything is to give my very best to God. Would you do that? You see, that's the church that's going to change the world. Not the half-hearted, lukewarm, on-the-fence, maybe kind of sort of church. 
I want to be church. I want to be part of the church that changes the world. That they're on fire in pursuit of God. Goo, 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 goo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what we, I'm sorry, Candy. I sh- I'm sorry. <laughs> <sighs> tell me of your desires. Tell me of your desires. Tell me what you're seeking. Tell me what you're wanting. And let me ask you this, because it's inevitable. Are you repenting when you relapse? Is, is repentance a common practice in your life? Because the Bible tells us, and it's so true from our experiences, that we all fail in many, in many ways, right? We all do. No one is righteous, not even one. No one ever hits that level here, right? No one's ever hitting the glory of God. We're not doing it. We're all going to fail. Are you repenting? Is it a common exercise? When you screw up in front of your kids, I hate having to apologize. Oh, my Lord, I do. And I know, Bailey, I know you're listening, and I know you love it when I apologize. (laughs) Right? Ooh, ooh but I have to. Because listen, if I don't, why would she? I've been charged with her. Oh my Lord. So that's remaining. So the first thing, the response is for every person on earth. The remaining is for the Christian. But the last one is returning. That's not for every person on earth and it's not for every Christian. It's just for some. And maybe that's you. Maybe you were that guy or that gal that were just had a hot thing for Jesus. And you were totally in. You were on it like crazy. I used to be into it, but now I'm not. I stopped obeying altogether. I stopped giving. I stopped serving. No talk. There's just, I just got busy doing other stuff. And I fell into a trap and my default sin kicked in again, you know, my besetting sin, the one thing that trips me up all the time. And so I just kind of followed that lead and I'm just, I'm so, if God is here, I'm in Australia somewhere, right? Some people, there may be someone in this room right now that feels that way. I don't know. Maybe. I want to encourage you. If you feel like maybe you've gone too far. Maybe you're without hope. I want to encourage you. Isaiah 59.1 says this. Just listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. No one's too far gone. No one's too far gone. Do, Do me this favor. Just do this. Did you breathe in? You're not too far gone. You're not too far gone. I want to reference back real quick and then we're done. Go back to Romans. In Romans 11, it's telling us that because of unbelief, you were once in. And because of your unbelief, you're not. Now, I didn't make this up. I did not write this. It says it. But here's the encouragement. Verse 23. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. No one, no one who is breathing has done so much that they can't turn around and run back into the wide open arms of the prodigal son's dad who is your father and he would embrace you. One last thing I want you to see. Please put it up on the screen. That right there is a quote from John 6, 37. And Jesus simply says this. He says, those that the Father gives him, that I will never reject those that come to me. He didn't say, I will never reject those who come to me the first time or the second time. Or they grew up in Sunday school and they never dropped the F-bomb. Or they never had a drink. Or they never did this. Or they never did that. It says that he will never reject anyone who comes to him. That's the good news. 
for all of us. So there's three different types of people. You keep your head down. Don't think. Don't look at me. There's three different types of people we kind of spoke about tonight. There's everybody. Maybe you're in the group that hasn't responded yet. Maybe you haven't said yes to the greatest, most complete revelation of Almighty God. It's Jesus Christ, the perfect one. The one who willingly went to the cross and offers you the only opportunity to be with Him forever in glory. No religion, no rules, no amount of charitable giving. No matter how nice you are to old ladies, it won't matter. We are under obligation as creation to accept the Creator's revelation. He said, listen to the Son. The Son said, I'm the only way. So maybe you're that person that just needs to say yes. For the first time, respond and respond well. And maybe you're a Christian and you've said yes, you've responded. You've responded to the good news. And there was a day when you were excited, man. You were so excited. You first got saved. You knew your eternity was different. You had a new perspective, a new attitude, a new person. A new person was born. But you would admit today that you're not as excited about Jesus and your relationship with him like you were that when it first started. The scriptures tell us we need to follow him just like we did when we accepted him on our knees on our faces in desperate need for the savior just reminded of the lady who pursued him with internal bleeding and she just did everything she could to just get to his robe is that you maybe you need to get back on track or maybe you're that last person that's so far gone so the sins piled up so high that you can't even see your way out of it but just remember this feelings and emotions are liars truth says that Jesus will never ever turn away anyone who comes to him so return to the Lord and he'll embrace you Lord God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the reason why we gather. He's the reason why we praise. He's the reason why we live. Thank you for sending him to the cross to pay for our sin. And right now, we're going to celebrate that right now, Lord, with you. As we take the bread to remember his body. And we take the cup to remember his blood. Take it in remembrance of him. Lord, I thank you for tonight. As the band comes forward, we're going to have an opportunity now to, to respond to him. But before we do, Jacob, if you could come up, please. We get to celebrate new life. Someone who's responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that is not a revolution clap. This is Jacob. No. Take your shoes off, brother. <laughs> Come on. You don't need it. He's not ashamed of the gospel. Come on, let's do this. You got anything in your pockets? Oh, yeah. Come on now. Oh, hey, everyone turn around. I'm moving. You didn't see that dip. Shh, don't. Don't. Don't judge. Don't judge. Sit down, brother. Let's take a moment. Let's pray for Jacob. Will you guys join in that? Lord, I thank you for this uh, beautiful man. I thank you, Lord, that you've opened up his heart to the truth 
of his sinfulness and his need for a Savior. I thank you, Lord, that you've opened up his heart not only to the need of a Savior, but to the need of the right Savior, the only Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. Lord, I know that even today, uh, the spiritual powers of the dark world have been battling for his obedience, and he has broke through that, and he's come today to be obedient to you. Lord, you have fought a battle for him, and you have won, yes, yet again. And Lord, I pray the same thing, that that would happen all the days of his life, that you would go to bat for him, you'd go to battle for him, that he would win battles not because of his own strength, his own ingenuity, his own creativity or wisdom, but Lord, that you would go to fight for him, and you would win. Just like you did in the scriptures when the nation of Israel was at war and they were outnumbered. Lord, you came and you confused the enemy. They started killing themselves. You won the battle for them. And Lord, you did that for him today. And I pray you'd continue to do that all the days of his life. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would pierce his heart in many ways. That he would wake him up to the reality of who you are. That he would follow you mightily. He would follow you passionately. That Lord, his... His spirit for you, his excitement, his enthusiasm for you would be lasting and deep and loving. It would be hot all the days of his life. Let him start this life right now praising you. Let him end this life on this earth with his hands held high, praising the creator of the universe. In Jesus' name, Jacob, who's your one and only Lord and Savior? Oh, that's awesome. Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ. You'll be raised to new life because you, you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.